Hello, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar from the Institute for Research on Poverty. I'm Dave Chancellor, and I'll be your host today. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here, uh, especially I know it's a busy time of year for a lot of folks, so uh, we appreciate everybody that's been able to get on today. Our, our webinar is called Weighing the Benefits of a Universal versus Targeted Child Safety Net. And one of our goals for this webinar is to take a look at the sort of broad question of whether it's better to help kids through universal programs or by targeting benefits specifically at lower income families. Uh, we're going to do this by looking at two very very different policy proposals. Uh, and for the first, we'll be hearing from Chris, Chris Weimer, who's a co-director of the Center on Poverty and Social Policy at Columbia University. And Chris will be talking about a plan for a universal child allowance that he's developed along with several other scholars from around the country. Uh, after that, we'll hear from Jim Ziliak, who's founding director of the University of Kentucky Center for Poverty Research and the Carol Martin Gatton Endowed Chair in Microeconomics there. Um, Jim's proposal involves an expanded and refundable child and dependent care tax credit that would be targeted at low to moderate income families. Our presenters will each take about 15 minutes to explain their proposals and after that we'll have some time for Chris and Jim to discuss more of the features and trade-offs of these plans and from there we'll turn to your questions. Uh, so you can type those into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to as many as we can on the last 10 or 15 minutes or so today. Uh, we do want to acknowledge the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the Department of Health and Human Services for their support of this webinar series. However, uh, this presentation doesn't necessarily reflect any positions or views of ASPE or IRP. Uh, we are recording today's webinar and expect to have it posted on the IRP, IRP YouTube channel and uh, linked on the IRP website by Friday of this week. And uh, so uh, Chris is going to start us off today, but um, first, uh, Chris and Jim, let me just uh, thank both of you for being here. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you for having us. Okay, so uh, Chris, I'll turn it over to you now. All right, cool. Um, I'm glad you uh, forwarded after that slide because I hate that photo of myself. But um, like, I'm going to talk about this proposal that we have with a group of, um, I guess it's 10 or 11 of us at this point, um, from across the country to. Uh, look at what the effect of a universal child allowance might be on reductions in child poverty, deep poverty, and extreme poverty in the U.S. Um, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Is that? Yeah, um, I think you might have your, uh, you up your computer speakers by chance. No, that's much better. Is that good? Okay. okay. Anyway. Um, all right, so this is a, a proposal with uh, Luke Schaefer, Sophie Collier here at Columbia, Greg Duncan, Kathy Eden, or Garfinkel, David Harris, Tim Sweeney, and Jane Longfogel, Chris Weimer, that's me, Hiro Yoshikawa. Um, and we've all sort of come together to um, design a, Julie Collins saying, no, this is not better yet, it's still feedback -y. <laughs> but I don't know. Um, so anyway, so it's a big group of us. Essentially, the, the genesis of it was that um, a group of us here at Columbia had modeled um, the effect of a child allowance on poverty for um, uh, in, in conjunction with the, the Century Foundation. And then um, Tim Smeeting and, and folks at UW and, and, and other places were thinking about it separately in terms of um, um, you know, just just the, the idea in principle. And so we sort of pooled together, which is what resulted in a, a team of like 11 co-authors, um, to put together a proposal that um, that would look at the effects of the universal child allowance on child poverty. And so um, I just do want to briefly want to thank some of the funders that contributed to this, which is the Annie Casey Foundation, the Century Foundation, um, IRP at Wisconsin, the JPB Foundation here in New York, and, um, and other folks. We're, we're sort of putting this together for the Russell Sage Foundation for a special journal issue on, um, I guess, what's called bold anti-poverty proposals. Um, uh, you know, that, that a number of scholars are putting forward, and this is one of them, so. All right, so, um, so what I'm going to talk about is the fact that child poverty in the U.S., even though we've made substantial progress on it um, over the past five decades, remains stubbornly high. Um, a lot of the benefit um, from um, child tax, from tax credits in the tax system goes to folks that are not at the lowest end of the distribution. 
of the income distribution. Um, and what we've really done in this country over, since 1996, at least, is move from uh, a system of cash-based assistance to a system that um, comes to families, low-income families, through in-kind assistance or through tax credits. So Kathy Eden and Luke Schaefer have talked about this a lot and, and how um, the fact the fact that um, there's a real lack of routine cash assistance um, for, for low-income families. Um, and while, while we've made improvements in the overall child poverty rate, um, you know, since the 60s and since the 90s, um, there really has been a group that's been left behind who really cannot maintain regular employment um, but, and, and, and relies on, on the system of in-kind assistance, whether it be food stamps, housing assistance, et cetera, um, but is not receiving regular, in, uh, re regular cash assistance. Um, so we argue that a stable source of income, a stable source of cash income, can I click on the green speaker button? Sorry. Oh, good point. All right. Yeah, does that help? Oh, that helps a lot. Okay. <laughs> um, and y'all can still hear me, right? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so, yeah, so we're, <laughs> sorry about that. So we're proposing a, a universal monthly child allowance to provide all children with a dependable cash income floor um, that would reduce child poverty is our, our argument. Um, so this is just to go into uh, some of our work here at Columbia where we've uh, uh, looked at trends in child poverty over time. Um, we use an, what, we, what we argue is an improved measure of poverty, of income poverty, called the supplemental poverty measure um, that um, that counts the resources that come from um, from tax credits like the EITC and the child tax credit and also counts the value of in-kind assistance like SNAP benefits, housing assistance, school meals, et cetera. And this is just to really show that um, we've made progress over time, more progress than is, is sort of commonly understood. Um, the, the two lines show anchored supplemental poverty measure. One is anchored in 2012, meaning that it's tied to um, contemporary living standards. Um, and the 1967 would show like the, the trends in child poverty as anchored in 1967 in, in you know, living standards uh, decades ago. But regardless of the measure used, we've seen uh, substantial progress in child poverty, but also in regards to, um, to either measure used child poverty remains stubbornly high, right? So even, even according to 1967 living standards, we're still seeing 10, 11% of children living in poverty in the US. So there's still substantial room in order to reduce child poverty in the US, which is sort of the motivation for our proposal. Um, so, you know, sort of as I said before, the US has increased its, its commitment to fighting poverty over the past half century, but increasingly that's come through the force, uh, so, sorry, increasingly has come in the form of tax credits and in-kind aid. Um, so as TANF, as, uh, as AFDC was converted into TANF and as, um, as cash assistance uh, has declined, you know, we've increased um, the resources that we're providing low-income families through expansions of work-based supports through the form of the Earned Income Tax Credit and also in-kind assistance in the, in the form of especially SNAP, which is um, one of our remaining uh, anti-poverty programs that responds directly in, into, uh, in response to um, increases in need. Um, but that leaves families without cash, um, and, and Kathy Eden and Luke Schaefer's work really sort of demonstrates this. Uh, TANF is a block grant now that goes to the states. It's been used to, um, you know, in some states like California, it still, it still provides substantial cash assistance to folks, but uh, in general, it, it, it's been converted more toward um, a source of revenue that states can use for a variety of, res uh, a variety of needs and a variety of um, uh, uh, goals in order to meet budget gaps. And so that leaves families without a regular source of, um, of, of cash, and cash is necessary, of course, to, you know, you, you can't, uh, you know, buy your kids' school, school uniforms with your food stamp dollars, you know, you can't, um, you know, repair your dishwasher, um, all that kind of stuff. So, so cash, we argue, is, is a, 
um, a basic need that families have and a universal child allowance is a way that we might be able to fill that gap. Um, and this just shows sort of the federal expenditures on, I'm just going to skip this slide actually and go to the next one. Um, so this slide just shows sort of the federal, the federal expenditures on cash and near cash programs for children. And you can see that a, a large share of that is um, being provided with, um, for the child tax exemption through the tax code and also the child tax credit, and then um, also the earned income tax credit. So it sort of reinforces the point that I made before that a lot of our assistance for children has sort of shifted to assistance through the tax code, which supports um, you know, working families and low-income working families, and that's great, but it also leaves behind of people who are not able to um, to maintain a steady source of income through employment. Um, and so the bottom part of this slide sort of shows the remainder um, of the, the social safety net for kids, which um, is sort of dwarfed by that that goes to, um, to, to working families. Um, so, and I'm going to skip this one too. Um, okay, so um, this slide sh sort of shows that um, the, the child poverty problem in the United States is still sort of stubbornly and persistently high um, relative to other advanced democracies. So if you look to the right of the United States um, on that, you see places that, um, you know, Mexico, Romania, Turkey, et cetera, but all these places um, that are, are sort of peer countries um, which all have a universal child allowance or child benefit um, have, have made much more uh, substantial reductions in child poverty um, than we see in the United States. Um, and so despite that progress that we made that I showed on, on one of the original slides, um, child poverty in the U.S. is still sort of strikingly high, especially in, 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 in relative terms to um, a lot of the advanced democracies that have instituted a universal child benefit. All right, <clears throat> so why would we do a monthly child allowance? Um, the first argument that we make is that the increased income would allow parents to increase their investments in their children, um, and that these investments would eventually yield improvements in child health and development. So for a long time, there was sort of debate in the literature about whether increased income um, is actually causally related to uh, improvements in children's health and development. There's now a good set of um, what I would say are, are pretty, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's an increased set of, of studies that establish causally that income actually matters for kids' health and development. And part of what part of the mechanisms for how that works is that it allows parents to buy things for their kids, invest in their education, invest in their child care, et cetera, and that that yields long-term improvements in their health and development. Um, income is also re related to improvements in, in health and development through reducing um, stress uh, in the family, and um, and that also leads to improvements in children's health and development. Um, there's some increased evidence about uh, this, this idea of sort of cognitive bandwidth, that like when parents are um, running around trying to provide food for their family and trying to just meet their basic survival needs, that there's less sort of cognitive bandwidth in order to deal with um, things that might be more related to children's long-term outcomes. Um, I think I'm talking too much. I'm going to get to the meat of it and skip a little bit about it. But anyway, you get the idea. Um, so our group came together, and we disagree on a lot of things. Um, so we disagree on funding mechanisms, um, you know, how, how our policy should be paid for, uh, et cetera. But we tried to come together to say, to put out a, a policy proposal that is based on sort of shared principles. Um, so the first principle that we all came to consensus on is that a child allowance should be universal, and that's sort of the topic of today's webinar. And the idea is that it should go to all kids um, such that there's a basic income floor, um, you know, for all children regardless of income, um, such that, you know, even in the event of, um, you know, a major unanticipated expense or change in income, your kid would still get this basic universal child allowance. Um, we also came to the consensus that the allowance should be um, uh, an accessible and frequent payment. 
So rather than one time a year, like the earned income tax credit or the child tax credit, it should be um, a monthly benefit that's distributed to families. Um, you know, we argue through probably the Social Security Administration. Um, and we try to argue that there, um, it, that it should be based on uh, an amount that is adequate to address basic family needs. Um, and so here we rely on some of uh, Hiro Yoshikawa's work to say um, that uh, an amount uh, of a child allowance of approximately $250 a month would, um, would, would meet the, the needs that families sort of express uh, in surveys and um, in the literature on the effects of income on, um, and child outcomes. So um, there are some additional considerations that we look at in the paper. Um, there's an idea in the literature that income is more consequential for families with very young children. So um, we therefore model a potential child allowance that is larger for families with children under five. Um, and there's also the consideration that perhaps um, the payments should decline as family sizes get larger so as not to incentivize um, larger and larger families in order to get larger, um, larger payments. So one consequence of that is that you could equivalize the payments such that, you know, your seventh child, your eighth child, like you'd get um, a smaller amount. And some of that's based not just on the incentivizing effects, but also on the fact that, um, you know, it takes it takes less money in, to pay for each additional child, right? So you can, you know, hand down clothing and toys and stuff like that. All right. So we model um, the effects of a child allowance in three different ways, sort of based on what I was just saying. The first is a simple model where we give every child $250 per month um, for every child under the age of 18. Uh, the second is a tiered model where we uh, give a, a slightly larger payment for children under the age of six and still keep the 250 per child for every child six to 17. And the third is that tiered and equivalized where we do the um, $300 for the young children, the $250 for the older children, but then also reduce the benefit levels um, as the number of children in the household increase. Um, it's important to note that in each case, um, while this is a universal benefit, we would uh, tax back uh, the additional income that families receive um, at the higher income levels. So we apply the marginal tax rate um, that any um, family would face on additional income um, such that the higher income families would, would wind up getting a smaller child benefit even though every family would, um, would receive the benefit. All right. So, um, what we do is we take the, uh, the current population survey, which is the basis of all of our annual poverty statistics, and we model the effects of this increased child allowance and child benefit. Um, and we, we simulate the taxes of taxing it back at the higher income levels that I just described. We also eliminate the, um, we would propose eliminating the child tax credit and the child exemption and the tax code. So these are sort of the net effects of those three policy changes, the increased child allowance, the, the elimination of the child tax credit, and the elimination of the child exemption benefit. And what you see is, um, you know, pretty substantial reductions in child poverty as a result of the universal child allowance. So from, um, these are the green bars, if you go left, from left to right. So you would see the child poverty rate, which was 16.7% um, in the most recent data, would drop to 9.6%. And if you increase that for Young children, you know, would drop a little bit further to 9.1%. If you equivalize that and made it a smaller benefit for larger families, you'd see a bit less poverty um, reduction effect, but still pretty substantial from 167 to 10.9%. The orange bars in the middle show the effect on deep poverty, which is um, uh, defined as 50% of the poverty line, and you'd see that would be reduced in half. Um, pretty much regardless of the way that the, the benefit is structured. And then the last is uh, the yellow bars, um, to the extent that there are yellow bars, is um, the $2 a day poverty, which is the, what we call extreme poverty, which is the, the, the um, phenomenon that um, Luke Schaefer and Kathy Eden document. And you can see that um, with the, like any version of the child allowance that we would 
um, pretty much wipe out extreme poverty in the United States. The next slide just shows the same thing for young children, so for children under six. And again, the story is the same, right? You'd reduce poverty from 18.5% to 10.6%, a bit more if you increase the benefit for young children, and a bit less if you equivalized it for larger families. Um, and uh, the same story for deep poverty, right? You'd be cutting that in half. Um, regardless of the benefit size, and then you'd be pretty much wiping out um, extreme poverty. Um, we've also looked at the, the sort of net distribution of, um, of, of the total resources that, uh, that families would get to sort of see are there places that, um, that families would on net sort of lose resources uh, or gain resources. And you can see from this slide that um, at $250 a month, um, all families would actually benefit, rich or poor. Um, if you make that benefit smaller, so um, we've looked at, for example, uh, a benefit size of $125 or $150, there would be a group that would sort of net lose in the middle of the distribution, so somewhere between like $75,000 and $200,000. Um, would lose, but if you did $250 a month, um, everybody would be a net a net gain. Um, this does come with a cost, um, and so uh, the cost savings from eliminating the CTC and the child exemption would be about $96 billion, according to our calculations. Actually, not our calculations, calculations from the Tax Policy Center um, at the Urban Institute and, and Brookings. Um, but if you did, for example, the universal $250 a month, the total direct cost would be $192 million, the cost savings would be $96 billion, and the net cost would be $96 billion. We don't um, argue that that should be unpaid for, um, but we argue that, you know, given the lack of consensus on how that should be paid for, that there are a variety of mechanisms um, that could be used to pay for them. So. Um, it could be a carbon tax, it could be a value-added tax, it could be a proportional tax um, on, um, according to income. Um, there are tax, um, uh, there are tax expenditures like the uh, mortgage interest deduction or charitable giving deduction, et cetera. So there's a variety of mechanisms to pay for this, and it really does depend and boil down to whether um, providing a basic income floor to our kids is, uh, is, a, is a bigger priority than some of those tax breaks. So um, I think I've talked too long, but um, the, the, um, we need to recognize that there's societal benefit to supporting parents and raising children. Um, the other thing I didn't mention is that, um, you know, the, despite the child poverty rate year to year, there's a much greater hazard that any individual family and any individual family with kids would experience the risk of poverty over time. So there's a lot of movement in and out of poverty. And so a, child, a universal child allowance would um, sort of present a, um, a, like a floor on that risk, hopefully. Um, our safety net has shifted to, um, uh, you know, benefit folks who are able to work, and, and that's great, um, but um, it has left behind a certain segment of um, the population. Um, so a universal child allowance would recognize that raising children is expensive and important and would yield long-term dividends in terms of kids' outcomes in the future. Um, the costs uh, are not in inconsequential, as I just showed, but, you know, they could certainly be paid for given the political will and the political commitment. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Chris. Okay, thanks so much, Chris. Uh, you know, Jim, I'll, uh, I'll turn to you now, you. okay? So uh, what I want to talk about is a proposal that I uh, wrote uh, three years ago as part of a Hamilton project at Brookings Institution uh, uh, event uh, where there were uh, a dozen or so of us that came up with uh, alternative policies to address poverty in America. And, and uh, my policy was focused on uh, supporting uh, low-income workers through uh, refundable child care credits. So, uh, my proposal is, is targeted uh, relative to Chris's, both in terms of the size uh, and scope and who's eligible, uh, as I'll uh, explain momentarily. 
So as a uh, background, uh, quality center-based child care is out of reach for many low-income families. Over the past two decades, child care costs have increased at twice the rate of overall inflation. And uh, center-based care can consume between one-fourth to one-third of a single mother's earnings, depending on the state of residence. Uh, because I wrote this proposal in 2014, some of my data are a few years old, and I, for that I apologize. However, the issues are very much uh, alive uh, and on the policy agenda, as, as I'll explain momentarily. So for example, in fiscal year 2012, the average cost for full-time center care for infants ranged from uh, $4,850 in Mississippi to uh, over $16,000 in the state of Massachusetts. Um, to give you a sense, this is data in Table 1 here uh, using uh, two years uh, from the current population survey. They started asking questions on uh, out-of-pocket child care costs to be used as part of their uh, supplemental poverty measure estimates. And as you can see, uh, this is focused on uh, families of worth working mothers. And I have uh, uh, four groups there, a single mom who has a child under age five, or a single mom with a child under age 13, and then uh, likewise for, for Mary. And there you can see a few things that are key takeaways. Uh, the median out-of-pocket uh, child care costs are about $3,000 for a, a single mom with a, a young child. And it's about $400 less than that uh, for a child under 13. Uh, what this is picking up, and you, uh, and you see that same gradient as well for the married uh, families also. And what it's picking up is the fact that that cost of child care is higher uh, for, for infants uh, re relative to uh, adolescents. The interquartile range is uh, pretty wide. And the, the third row there you'll see is median family earnings. So what you'll note is that uh, while uh, out-of-pocket child care costs uh, uh, exceed for, uh, uh, for married families, exceed those for, for single mother families, uh, you can see the median earnings uh, about four times higher amongst uh, those married families than, than among singles. So you can see it takes a much larger bite out of the single mother family's uh, pocketbook than it does, does for married families. Okay. Uh, this next map gives you a sense of kind of the geographic distribution of these out-of-pocket child care expenses relative to median earnings. This is for single mothers by state. Uh, uh, this is uh, single mothers with children under age uh, 13. And you can see that uh, uh, there's a wide distribution from 6% uh, uh, in the state, or 5%, excuse me, in the state of uh, Montana, up to a high of 28% uh, in the state of Delaware. Uh, you can see if you, you know, if you stare at it closely, you can see that on average, costs uh, seem to be higher east of the Mississippi River for, for, for uh, single mother uh, families. So this has become a significant issue uh, for, for these uh, low-income uh, working households, uh, and one that's become increasingly uh, um, uh, stressful financially for these families over the last two decades. So the challenge is coinciding with the surging cost of child care has been a decline in employment rates of single and married mothers with dependent children. So these uh, next few figures will sh show you some trends in employment rates. So first, we have employment rate of women with children under age 13 uh, by marital status and by education. And you can see there is a huge surge uh, in, the, in the mid to late 1990s in employment rates of uh, single mothers. And this is most pronounced amongst those that had less than high school uh, or amongst those who are never married. Uh, and you do see a, a, a kind of a more gradual increase in employment uh, amongst uh, married uh, mothers and uh, less so uh, for, for uh, those with skill, single moms with uh, higher, higher skills. But across uh, the spectrum, both by marital status and, and by education attainment, you can see there's been a secular decline in employment rates uh, since the, the uh, uh, 2000 peak. And, and in fact, you can see that the employment rates of single moms uh, and these uh, uh, single moms are about what they were at the uh, 
passage of the 96 welfare reform or at the implementation in 1997 roughly. Um, so those gains that were made uh, over the, that, that kind of post-reform era have uh, largely eroded away. And amongst uh, uh, married uh, mothers, you can see that employment rates are back to levels that they were in the, in the uh, mid-1980s. Uh, this next figure uh, breaks it down by poverty status. So it's uh, single uh, mother families with children under age 13, uh, less than uh, uh, the poverty line or less than twice the poverty line, and then also for, for married uh, families, also below the line and below twice the poverty line. And again, you can see that, you know, there's, especially among single moms uh, living in poverty or twice near poverty, that there was a big increase in employment rates in the 1990s. Much of that has been attributed to expansions in the earned income tax credit. Some of it was to welfare reform, and of course some of it was to the booming macroeconomy. And then there's been uh, this uh, secular decline over the last decade. The red line is for uh, married mothers uh, and families with uh, incomes less than twice the poverty line, and you can see that their employment rates by 2012 were actually below those in 1980. And then lastly, you know, what's happening in the actual employment status amongst uh, uh, single moms. So the top line uh, depicts the fraction of those employed uh, who are full-time, full year. And uh, you can see that when there was that big growth in the mid to late 1990s, most of that growth took place uh, amongst those working full-time, full year. And there was a subsequent uh, large decline in the percentage of the single moms not in the labor force, meaning they, they didn't work at any point in time uh, over, uh, over that uh, prior calendar year. But then uh, after 2000, you can see that the decline in employment is mostly coming from a decline in full-time, full year. You can see that red line with, this, uh, with the squares, there is some uh, secular growth in part-time, full year but we've seen a larger increase in not in the labor force over that time period. So uh, that decline in full-time, full year is, is uh, coming at the cost primarily of withdrawal from the labor force. So research suggests, and, and so, you know, the question is uh, how much of this employment change is, is uh, connected to uh, the rising cost of child care. Uh, I've not done a decomposition to, uh, uh, attribute uh, a certain percentage to that. It's, uh, it's simply a correlation at this point in time. Uh, with that in mind, uh, there is uh, ample research, and Chris alluded to some of that in his presentation, that children do better on a host of uh, cognitive and non-cognitive measures. Uh, Chris alluded to uh, access to, to more income. Uh, in, in, in this case, uh, the income that I'm going to propose is is income that can be utilized uh, in center-based versus informal care. So there's uh, a number of surveys uh, that have been done on research looking at center-based versus informal care and uh, child outcomes. And in general, uh, children do better in those uh, formal organized uh, settings than they do the, the, the informal setting. Another uh, uh, kind of fact that motivates my proposal is the research on the responsiveness of mother's employment to changes in the, uh, uh, basically, the after-tax wage, which is a function of uh, out-of-pocket child care costs. And so there's a series of studies that have been done over the last uh, uh, two to three decades, um, and that research tends to find elasticities that range from minus 0.3 to minus 0.4 for single moms, which means if uh, we reduce the uh, effective child care uh, price by uh, 10%, we'll increase employment rates by 3 to 4%. And that uh, elasticity is, is a larger uh, uh, minus 0.5 to minus 0.6 uh, for married mothers, suggesting that uh, the labor uh, supply response is quite substantive to changes in the uh, price of child care. So in the United States, uh, I'm not going to uh, belabor this point too much uh, uh, going through all these uh, different programs. I want to focus mo mostly on the child and dependent care tax credit. Uh, the, the, in the U.S., uh, basically assistance to, uh, uh, for child care comes both direct and indirect. 
the direct forms come primarily through, first, the Child and Dependent Care Tax Credit, uh, which I'll explain to you in, in uh, detail uh, momentarily. Uh, there is a direct assistance from the Child Care Development Fund. It used to be called the Child Care and Development Block Grant. Uh, there is direct assistance from Temporary Assistance to Needy Families, uh, as, because part of that block grant is used to provide uh, child care assistance to those qualifying. And then there's also um, uh, dependent care flexible spending accounts that, you can, uh, that, that can be set aside on a pre-tax basis that are direct. And then indirect assistance comes through the child tax credit, both the uh, refundable and the non-refundable uh, portion. Uh, so let me uh, tell you about, well, one of the, let me highlight a couple of uh, shortcomings with the Child Care Development Fund. Um, and, and, and TANF and the State Maintenance of Effort combine the CCDF and TANF and State Maintenance of Effort uh, is about $10 billion uh, per year. Um, uh, in the CCDF fund, estimates suggest that uh, nearly half the states have waiting lists or frozen intake into eligibility to the CCDF. Um, uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services estimated in fiscal year 2009 that about only one in six children eligible for assistance in either CCDF uh, child care or TANF child care uh, received assistance. So it suggests as though uh, um, uh, eligibility, uh, while is great, uh, ability to take up is quite low. Um, and so what I'm going to focus then, and then the concern about the child tax credit is that it's not targeted particularly well. So the Tax Policy Center uh, at the Brookings and Urban Institute uh, estimates that only about 13% of child tax uh, credit benefits go to the uh, bottom uh, quintile, the income distribution. Uh, about 10% of the benefits go to the top uh, income quintile. And then the remaining uh, roughly 80% go to the, to the middle three uh, quintiles. And so the, it's not focused on, on kind of the, the low-income population as much as the proposal that I'm about to present. Okay, so let me tell you about the Child Dependent Care Tax Credit. Uh, it was established in 1976. It makes it, it's the oldest child care credit uh, in the tax code. It's non-refundable. It covers qualifying child care expenses for working parents with children under age 13. The credit's worth 35% of qualifying expenses if your adjusted gross income is less than $15,000. This means that the maximum credit is $1,050 for the first child, and uh, it's capped, if you have two or more, at $2,100. The credit rate is then reduced at uh, one percentage point for each $2,000 of AGI above $15,000. Now, it turns out, then, that the credit rate plateaus at uh, a rate of 20% with uh, adjusted gross income of uh, 43,000. It's not capped, and I'll come back to that, okay? So, so people with AGI of $5 million uh, can still qualify for the Child and Dependent Care Tax Credit. So my proposal is to convert the, CC, uh, the Child and Dependent Care Tax Credit from a non-refundable credit to one that's refundable, that's targeted to low- and middle-income families. Uh, as I mentioned, current law does not limit eligibility based on income. Therefore, the majority of the uh, tax expenditures are spent on those families with incomes between $100,000 and $200,000, based on estimates from Elaine Mogg at the Tax Policy Center. Um, the other worry about the current uh, tax credit is that it's only uh, allowed for filers with positive pre-credit pre tax liability, which means many uh, current EITC recipients don't even qualify for this tax credit because they don't have uh, a positive uh, tax liability pre-credit. In addition, my proposal uh, will cap eligibility at $70,000, making it a progressive function of income. It's also progressive with respect to the age of the child and the utilization of a certified licensed care facility, as I'll now explain. So in this table here, I show kind of the schedule of these, uh, these credits. I break it down between licensed uh, facility uh, care centers and unlicensed care centers. Uh, the basic idea is that license will, will apply to uh, licensed center-based care. 
unlicensed will apply to uh, informal forms of care. Uh, we, we don't want to strictly limit eligibility to center-based care uh, for a variety of reasons. One, uh, many people already have uh, a, a well-trusted uh, system of uh, informal care. It's also the case that uh, many low-income people have non-standard work schedules. And so while they may have to work second or third shift, uh, it's very rare to find a center-based care open uh, at, at those hours. And so uh, care oftentimes is informal for, the, for that uh, segment of the workforce. And so uh, we want to allow both uh, licensed and, and unlicensed uh, um, care to be uh, eligible for the credit. However, I have a larger credit uh, possible for licensed uh, facilities as opposed to unlicensed. So the proposal is that um, for children under age five, uh, the credit rate will be 100% if your adjusted gross income is less than $25,000. Uh, the allowable uh, uh, out-of-pocket uh, uh, ex qualifying expenses would be $4,000 for the first child, and then it would be uh, a maximum of $6,000 for uh, uh, two or more children. So this means that the maximum credit that you qualify for would be $4,000 if your AGI is uh, under $25,000, uh, uh, or $6,000 if you have uh, uh, two or more children with $6,000 or more uh, dollars in qualifying expenses. Then uh, for this uh, population, that credit rate would be reduced by 10 percentage points for every $5,000 of AGI above uh, $25,000. And you can see from the table that uh, uh, after $70,000, you're no longer eligible for, for the credit. Then notice that I have a lower rate for children ages 5 to 12. And this is to account for the fact that um, uh, child care costs are, uh, are less for, for that uh, demographic group, so the rate is 70 percent, uh, and then it will be reduced for uh, seven percentage points for, for every 5,000 of AGI. Again, eligibility ends at $70,000. And then for the unlicensed facility rates, the respective uh, credit rates are 50 percent and 35 uh, percent accordingly with uh, a taper rate of five percentage points and three and a half percentage points. Uh, but again, in both cases, the uh, credit base remains the same uh, as it does for, for the license uh, facility case. Okay. Now, uh, the benefits are that uh, this policy is going to be more target efficient to those in need of assistance and covering child care costs. In addition, the proposal can be, the, the refundable credit can be used in conjunction with the EITC. So that uh, is, a, is a current uh, regressive feature of the tax code that would be overturned with my proposal. The proposal incentivizes licensed care for children. Um, I was unable to get a, uh, um, a cost estimate of the, uh, of the proposal, but uh, the Tax Policy Center some years ago uh, proposed a related reform and estimated that the 10-year cost would be in the 50 to $70 billion uh, over current law. Okay, so it's, it's, not, uh, it's not free, and it's not necessarily intended to be uh, a revenue-neutral reform. Uh, there is uh, bipartisan support uh, for, for uh, converting the child and dependent care credit uh, into uh, a refundable credit. Uh, a couple months after my uh, proposal was released, Democratic Senator Shaheen, Boxer, Murray, and Gillibrand proposed a bill in the Senate to convert the uh, uh, credit to uh, refundable credit. Currently, uh, in President Trump's tax uh, plan, uh, the, the attempt is to convert, uh, the current conversation is to convert the child dependent care credit to a refundable credit. So uh, it seems as though there's support on both sides of the aisle uh, to move forward on, on a proposal of this nature. Implementation, um, currently the, the, the uh, tax form is Form 2441. It requires the filer to report the name, address, and the employer that provides the service and the amount paid. So there's already a tax schedule there um, uh, in the tax code. So it's, it's simply converting it from one that uh, uh, is not refundable to, to one that's refundable. In addition, uh, it would require uh, the, the registry of licensed care facilities, which states currently 
uh, keep track of uh, to be linked to IRS records so that one could um, uh, track uh, licensed versus uh, unlicensed care providers. Uh, I recognize that this is an administrative uh, uh, hassle and burden uh, uh, relative to not distinguishing between licensed and unlicensed care. Uh, there are some ways that one could combat uh, some of the concerns about potential fraudulent claims. Uh, so for example, in the tax code, if you own a mortgage, you receive a 1098 each year uh, from that's sent to you by the bank, and the bank also sends it to the IRS that depicts you know, how, many, how much you pay in uh, interest uh, over the prior year. And if you're paying college tuition, you receive a 1098-T that the university or college also sends to the IRS. And so this is used as kind of a backstop on uh, uh, your claims for, for deductions in the tax code. And then finally, uh, 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 kind of playing off Chris's idea that there's the possibility of uh, converting this to an advanced uh, refundable credit. Um, so for example, both uh, New Zealand in the, in the United Kingdom do this, and then they reconcile it at the end of the year. Now, we can come back to the United Kingdom. Uh, UK is moving to this universal uh, uh, benefit system that's uh, different than, than the prior one. But New Zealand uh, allows you to take it uh, and, uh, monthly, and then if you receive too much, um, uh, then you can reconcile it at the end of the, end of the tax year. I propose capping the advance to no more than 50% of the prior credit. Um, in order to limit the possibility of overpayment and people getting uh, kind of surprised with the tax liability uh, at the end of the year. So with that, I think I'll stop so we can open up to, uh, to questions. Okay, thanks so much, Jim. So uh, first, um, we, we're going to move to just a short discussion, and mostly I want to talk about trade-offs uh, with these, especially kind of looking at this, uh, the overall concept of, you know, targeted versus universal programs. So, um, Chris, I'm going to invite you to go first. Uh, you know, if you'd like to talk about um, some of the potential maybe downsides of your plan, and then uh, we can perhaps follow up, um, you know, if you, if you want to talk about uh, sure. some of the um, downsides so of well, first off, uh, the there other, are other no guys' plan. Sure, to my plan. Um, but, uh, no, I mean, I think one of the, the main trade-offs is this issue of cost, right? Um, so when you do a universal program like the policy that we're proposing, it, it is, um, you know, quite costly. But um, the, the upside of that is that, um, y you know, it, it, in my mind, it becomes more politically sustainable because it's a benefit that is not targeted toward someone who's not like me you know it's um it's something that everybody gets it's it's guaranteed and it's um it, you know it's, it's universal and there's the advantage of the universality is that um you know everyone sort of is bought into the system and everyone knows that they're going to get a benefit regardless of the circumstances that happen to them um but you know there does come a cost to that because you are giving benefits to people who are fairly high up the income distribution um, even if you tax it back as additional income. Um, <clears throat> uh, Tim Smeeting, who I think is on the line, you know, w would argue that you could uh, tax, not, not tax back, but you could, um, you could make the new income that we would be giving people um, countable for, uh, in relation to access to other benefits. So you could make it countable income, for example, in terms of the eligibility for food stamps or the eligibility for housing assistance. Um, so that's another way you could save cost, um, but, you know, that would, that would be sort of taking away benefits, um, you know, from some folks in order to, to sort of pay for it. Um, so anyway, so yeah, that's, that's my argument about the trade-offs, but I, I think the universality is both, um, it's an advantage because it's sort of a political, um, a political win in a way that, that makes it like a societal guarantee rather than a means-tested sort of targeted thing that would come under attack in, in you know, in, in favoring one group over another, that kind of thing. Um, so that's the main trade-off I see in my mind. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and Jim, does your plan also have uh, no trade-offs? Uh, well, relative to current tax code, I would say no. It doesn't have any downsides. I think right at this point in time, um, uh, 
the, the current policy is incredibly regressive. And so I would view converting the uh, child independent care tax credit to a refundable one uh, would be a, a dramatic improvement in the uh, uh, redistributive aspect of the, of the, of the tax code. Uh, people differ on, on uh, how targeted it should be. So for example, the Democratic senators, I think, uh, included eligibility of $200,000. Uh, the cost of doing that means that uh, the uh, uh, maximum credit was, is smaller than the one that I'm proposing. So, so the proposal that I have is uh, by making it uh, more targeted at uh, low and, and uh, middle income families uh, means that it is uh, one that uh, uh, is allowed, to, you know, is capable of putting more dollars into the pockets of those that need it most. Um, uh, now, the you know, the obviously the big downside of mine. And this is a question that Dr. Smeeting raises, and that is, what does my proposal do for non-working uh, mothers? And the and the and the answer to that is nothing, right? And so that's where the big difference is between. Uh, Chris's proposal and mine is that mine's targeted at the workforce. Uh, Chris's is universal. I think it's important to recognize that many of the uh, uh, OECD countries do both. They provide both child allowance and they provide uh, uh, tax credits for, uh, for, for, for child care. And uh, some of these countries, like in Canada, is, is kind of merging these two, and the UK is as well. And, and by merging them, they're actually making them, them larger than either Chris nor, and, and my proposal is uh, in isolation. And so, uh, you know, I think we're actually still, you know, several steps behind our OECD uh, uh, neighbors. Yeah, and I, I would say I don't think Jim and I really, like, disagree on either of our proposals. Well, I shouldn't speak for Jim, but, you know, like, <laughs> I, I think a targeted, uh, you know, child care tax credit that he's talking about is totally worthwhile, um, but it's a different ball of wax than the universal child allowance that we're talking about. And it would reach different people, obviously, and would have differential effects. Um, but, you know, um, both are worth doing, <laughs> I think. Okay. Uh, Jim, no. did you have any uh, final final points or any feedback on uh, on Chris's plan there? Okay. Okay. Well, let's move to uh, Q and A then. And uh, so uh, the the question that I'd like to start off with, um, and I, I'm going to remind everyone to uh, please do enter your questions in the Q and A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, but uh, we we have a question that's looking for more clarification about what uh, would actually be constituted by licensed uh, centers, and this, you know, what would that include? Um, certified family child care. Yeah, I think uh, that you know. Settings, uh, or, uh, uh, the, uh, what, what do we mean there? Best, uh, got a good question there, and 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 I think the idea is that. Yes, uh, under my uh, proposal, uh, license would be those licensed uh, uh, with the state. I, I do think that um, uh, as long as they're certified uh, by the state, um, then, then I think that in, in that case, that would be eligible for the higher, uh, higher benefit. The hope is that by providing these, these credits, right, it obviously reduces the uh, out-of-pocket costs for, for, for families, uh, and, and uh, the supply side of the market will respond in kind by uh, uh, providing uh, a more uh, a larger and, and, and more skilled uh, labor force to that uh, current sector. Okay, uh, so our, our next question is from Stephanie, and this is uh, to you again, Jim, um, but it's, it's mostly asking, you know, are, is, would it be better to just kind of give this money uh, more directly and, and maybe not necessarily targeted at just child care costs? Uh, are, are there other families, especially low-income families? Yeah, that so it's uh, a good cash? question, and, and so that's, you know, part of the reason, because uh, I'm sympathetic that, that, you know, I think the greatest challenge facing uh, 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 low-income families, and in particular those uh, living in deep poverty, is lack of access to, to liquidity, some cash. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> so um, by uh, 
offering the option of an advance uh, credit that would provide, because uh, child care is a month-to-month -month cost or, or even at, at a sub, you know, weekly interval, depending on, on the type of care you're receiving, uh, that, that the advanced uh, uh, child care tax credit um, uh, would, would allow them access to that cash on a monthly basis. Uh, New Zealand and the UK, they actually do direct deposit into the person's you know, bank account or credit, credit and savings account, whatever the case may be. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's all automated and uh, it provides a, a steady, ready source of, of, of cash for these individuals to cover uh, what is a, uh, increasingly a, a, one of the largest uh, portions of their, their family expenditure, uh, just behind uh, housing, and, and in many of these states, uh, far exceeding the cost of transportation. Okay. Um, so our, our next question, I think both of you can answer this, but uh, you know, I, I, we'll start out with Crystal. I, I'd like to talk about uh, sort of incentives for some family uh, things like childbearing and marriage. I mean, does this sort of change? Um, so that's uh, you one know, of are the we things that about we try that? to take on with, by, by equivalizing it um, so that there wouldn't be um, any incentive to, you know, have more and more kids. But usually, I mean, what we're talking about is $250 a month, right? So. That is three thousand dollars a year. I, you know, I don't think many people are, you know, having a child or making a decision about, you know, not going to work or going to work, um, you know, based on that amount of money. It's it's essentially an income floor, to um, to to provide for basic expenses. I think most people who are capable of working want to work, and getting three thousand dollars a year for their kid is not going to, you know, change the the incentive structure that much. Maybe they'll work a few less hours. Maybe there'll be a few people on the margin who don't go to work. But um, we're not super worried about that, or at least I'm not. Um, there, there is some literature on the effect of some of these programs um, on behavioral incentives in terms of going to work and employment and hours and all that kind of stuff. And there is some, you know, there is some evidence that there are, um, you know, I th what I would characterize as, as sort of small effects, but also these programs go in different directions. So like the earned income tax credit incentivizes work and incentivizes more employment. Um, you know, and this kind of thing, like a, a universal chattel allowance might allow, you know, a parent to stay home longer when their kid is an infant, but we might want that, <laughs> you know, um, rather than making that parent go to work, you know, while the kid is two months old, you know, so that, that can pay dividends as well, even if it reduces, you know, employment in the short term. No, I mean, certainly I don't think Jim, did you have uh, to the structure, you know, the main incentive that, that uh, my proposal aims at is, is the use of license as opposed to unlicensed care. Um, I don't, I don't think that there's going to be any, I mean, that, the scope of, of uh, research evidence on the fertility response to, to social assistance generally comes up with a, if it's not a null effect, it's a very small effect, and as Chris noted. And so I, I, don't, I don't foresee this to be a, a substantial effect either on fertility or, or marriage. You know, we are just about out of time, but I, I do want to allow uh, both of you to get a chance for kind of a final word there. We're, we're getting more questions, but um, we, we do wrap it up in the hour. Uh, so, Jim, well, I'll I let think you take that, first shot uh, at um, you know, any concluding thoughts for us. At this point in time, uh, the, you know, the evidence is clear that uh, child care costs have become um, uh, excessive for, for many families, uh, many low-income uh, families in, in, in our country, and that uh, we have... Uh, uh, some tools to, to take some immediate action on that. And so my proposal to convert the uh, current uh, child independent care tax credit to a refundable one, I think, is a, is a very workable uh, uh, solution to, to this problem. It doesn't solve the problem of getting cash into to the non-workers, so I'll let Chris make a, a push for that. I think it's a great idea. 
Um, uh, but I do think that there are uh, many advantages to, to uh, providing that refundable credit uh, to use in tandem with the earned income tax credit. Uh, it, the, under my proposal, it would be of equal size or larger to the EITC, which would be a dramatic reduction in uh, child poverty in this country. Uh, yeah, so I'm just partially responding to um, Kimberly's <laughs> question about the single mom, single dad. Our benefit would actually be tied to the kid. And so um, it wouldn't matter if you're a single mom, single dad, married parent, whatever. It would be tied to the kid. And we understand there would be some, you know, administrative hurdles around that, but that's not new to our proposal. I mean, it's it's true of the earned income tax credit. You know, people can claim the same child. It depends on how, you know, how often the child um, or how many months of the year, you know, the child spends with the parent, et cetera. So we would have to deal with the same kinds of things administratively, but it would be a benefit for the child. And it sort of relates back to the question of sort of the incentives and how people spend it. But um, And I would say that there's not, like, amazing evidence on this, but that when you – it matters how you label things. So if you, if you label something a child benefit, if you label something a child care tax deduction or child care tax credit or whatever, then, like, parents are more likely to use it for that. And, and there's some evidence that – you know, there's no, well, sorry, there's little evidence that parents are going to spend any of this on, like, cigarettes and alcohol and all that kind of stuff that people worry about, especially when you call it and label it, you know, a child benefit, then people spend it on their kids. Okay, thanks so much to both of you. I, I just so appreciate your time, Chris and Jim. Uh, and so uh, just a reminder that we will have a recording up of this on the IRP YouTube channel and on our website uh, by Friday. Um, and uh, for our next webinar uh, that I want to invite everyone to, and that's not going to be until July 19th, 2017, but uh, same time, so 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central, and we're going to have Alexis Harris uh, talking about her recent book from the Russell Sage Foundation called The Pound of Flesh, Monetary Sanctions as Punishment for the Four, talking uh, for the poor. Uh, talking about fines and fees. Um, yeah. Thank you. Let, let me again thank just thank you. everyone for being here, and uh, so long.